Hello, hello, and welcome to another podcast episode of Overpowering Emotions, where I talk all things big emotions, emotion regulation, anxiety management, resilience. We're on our journey of resilience. Now, I had a question actually from last week. I was talking about the trap of being perfectionists in our own lives and having high expectations in our own life for ourselves. So we definitely need to work on that perfectionism and be better role models for our kids. And I also talked, I, you know, I touched on some of those unspoken expectations that we put on kids. And I had a few questions, actually, if people were wanting me to talk about that a little bit more because I had only just touched, you know, on a couple of examples like corrective feedback. But, you know, they were just wondering what are all of the ways because parents are worrying. And even some, I had a couple of teachers reach out to you, like, what are some other ways that we might inadvertently? So I thought that I would just kind of cover that trap a little bit more, you know, that can make perfectionism worse in our kids. Because we, like I said last week, we might not even know that we're setting those high expectations, which is why we really need to address this because our very good intentions of wanting them to excel can really backfire. Um, one that's really easy to address is normalizing mistakes. Because if those mistakes are not normalized, whether it's at home or at school or whatever other places kids find themselves in, they, they're, they're, they're going to develop that fear of failure. They're going to avoid new experiences. They're going to avoid any challenges to protect their self-esteem, right? It's easier to avoid than to be vulnerable. And so that's why I love celebrating everyone's mistake of the day. I'm always talking about that. What was the mistake of the day? What have you learned? We're just help. We're, we're not just talking about normalizing mistakes. We're really just creating the environment where mistakes are normal. They are celebrated. Watch a little clip of Meet the Robinsons when he makes that mistake and he's like, ah, oh, bummer, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. And the whole family is like, hooray, and they have a little mistake party, right? We really want to normalize the heck out of those mistakes. Now, of course, Again, we all want the best of our kids, for sure. We want them to succeed. We want to have high expectations. We want to make sure they feel loved. But sometimes our efforts to help them be happy, to achieve success, to be socially successful, whatever it is, we might unintentionally communicate that our love, our validation, our approval, whatever, are tied to their performance or to their behavior. And I know most of us who are listening, obviously, are never going to tell a child, you have to be perfect to earn my love, right? We are not explicitly saying those things. However, there are things that we might be communicating unconsciously, unknowingly, that they believe they need to be perfect to earn their, you know, to our approval, but you know, for them to get that love or worthiness or whatever it is leading to perfectionism. And last time I had mentioned, you know, kids might think that my parents, yes, they do. I know that they said they expect everything to be perfect. But then I asked parents and I'm like, no, not at all. Like not even close to that. So we see this again, you know, I did talk about criticizing mistakes or just nicely correcting their mistakes. Hey, buddy, where does your dish go? Hey, kiddo, what about your room? Hey, kiddo, you know, it's all well-intentioned. We're, again, wanting them to be successful. We're being really nice about it. But again, we're we're unintentionally saying that that mistake is unacceptable. It needs to be immediately fixed, right? And we're telling them what to do. So children will start to fear making mistakes. They might develop that perfection or nothing mindset. And, and anything less than that perfect is a complete failure, right? And the response effort to go back and redo a dish and go back and re-vacuum a floor or whatever it is, is so overwhelming. So now they might avoid all mistakes at all costs to earn praise and to avoid, you know, that extra response cost. Or they might act out or just not like, screw you, I can't do anything either, right? That's just another piece that could come out of that. But maybe we're praising. Maybe we're only praising them when they, they, they get those high grades, right? Or if they score a goal in a game or they do something perfectly. So that sends the message that your approval is tied to their performance and that outcomes again. So even when we're praising that... 
But, you know, when we're looking at their progress, how often do you actually look at their progress? It's either did you or did you not get an A? Did you or did you not get that spelling correct? Did you or did you not get a goal, right? That's what we're, we're always focused on those outcomes, which we got to get out of that, right? I talked about the binary thinking. And so we need to use that to our advantage. How often are we looking at their progress? If we're so focused on the mistake, that's really going to make them believe they need to be perfect for our love, for our approval, right? Or maybe we're not fixing it, but we're always on their case, right? About doing homework or studying or doing their chores or we're checking online what they should be doing, right? So, so we're always focusing on stuff all the time. It could even just be nagging, 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 nagging about everything else, cleaning your room, emptying the dishwasher, being quieter, right? Being on screens too much, commenting about how they did do something or didn't do something right, right? Or they didn't do it good enough or they forgot to do it at all. Maybe you don't comment. Maybe you're just visibly disappointed when they don't meet their expectations. Kids are so perceptive, right? It's incredible. Even if we never say those words directly, they're going to interpret our reactions and, uh, you know, and any feedback as indicators of their worth. Even when we're nice, but we're focusing on results, like praising the A's, winning the games, excelling in some activity, right? Um, especially when we're not acknowledging their hard work or their effort or their learning processes, right? Then we're reinforcing that the results is what matters no matter what. And that's when kids believe that their worth is tied to their achievements, that their level of success is directly equated to how much you love them, right? And we see this with siblings too. Sibling is getting praised. That could be it. Maybe we're not even doing any of these things with child A, but child B, oh, we're praising, you know, and they're getting so much more positive feedback when they are doing good, whatever doing good means. So they really start to believe that their value comes from what they achieve. It's not from their effort. It's not even for who they are as children, right? They don't see those as, as two separate entities. It's all kind of one. So any statements like, wow, you got 95% on that test. Wow, that's so amazing. I'm so proud of you for getting that A. That's saying that your pride is linked to success. Or if you say you're so smart, without saying anything about how hard they worked. That can, you know, lead them to believe that intelligence and therefore their value is inherent in them and they must always preserve that intelligence, right? And they they do that by being the best and always having an A, nothing less, right? It's really tricky, isn't it? <laughs> this, these statements, they seem positive, but they can make kids feel like mistakes or failures or anything less than perfect is disappointing and it's not acceptable. Sometimes we do set unrealistic expectations about how our kids should behave, how they should interact with their friends, expecting kids to always be polite, respectful, calm, focused, whatever, you know, whatever it is that you're telling them to be that can contribute to their belief that anything less than always 100% being focused and calm and whatever Less than that perfect is unacceptable. Even small comments like, you need to be on your best behavior at all time, or I expect you to do better, right? Those can set unrealistic expectations because they start to believe what that they're worth and all of those things. You must always be well behaved, never make any mistakes to earn my love, right? Even though we're not saying those words, that's how kids are interpreting things. So we need to recognize that all children, they're developing in this stage, they're going to make mistakes, whether it's a behavior, right? Whether it's social interactions, focus, behavior, going to grandma's house and being respectful, all of these things, their brain is still developing. Gosh, I don't even know any adults who are perfect all the time in every area. So we need, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to mess up. They're going to be a little too loud, you know, at grandma's house or in the library. They're going to forget and chuck their pencil across the room to hit their friend because it's really funny. I still do that kind of stuff, right? Where I'm chucking stuff at my kids just to see if I can hit it in the forehead. 
especially at the end of the day when my meds have worn off, right? A little bit of impulsivity. We all make mistakes. So instead of focusing on perfection, we're encouraging self-awareness. We're going to help them reflect on their experiences and what they learned for next time. We're not going to tell them about their mistakes and what they need to do. We're going to ask open-ended questions. Again, comparison is another big one. Last week, I was talking about when we self-compare with other people with these curated lives online, but we might make subtle comparisons too, whether it's about, you know, to siblings or to friends or classmates, that can really make kids feel like they're constantly being measured against other people. So saying something like, why can't you keep your room clean like your sister or your friend did so well on the test? underlying might be what happened on yours, but wow, your friend did amazing. Kids start believing that they have to be better, that they have to be better than their sibling, that they have to be better than their friends or whomever else to be loved or appreciated. And so we start fostering that competitive mindset where they constantly feel inadequate and need to be the best. Or if we're frequently expressing any concern over external opinions of others. What do teachers or coaches or other parents think? Kids start to feel that their worth is tied to how other people perceive them. And so now that's going to lead to anxiety about being judged or criticized. So if you catch yourself saying things like, oh man, what will your teacher think if you show up to school looking like that? Or if you hand that work in, what is your teacher going to think of this? Or what are other parents going to think if you behave like that? Or if you wear those pajamas to the party or like to the birthday party, you might be sending the message that they need to be overly concerned with other people's approval. Even though explicitly we might say, don't worry about what other people think. We are sending these messages. Another big one is when we aren't validating kids' feelings. And that's why I spend so much time on making sure we're validating kids' feelings. If they feel like they're not validated, they might feel like they need to suppress their emotions because they're bad or they're not a big deal, right? And that can lead to some emotional perfectionism where they believe that showing any vulnerability or any struggling is a sign of failure. And oftentimes we invalidate because we want to protect our kids from feeling bad. But even when we're trying to make them feel better, we might downplay their feelings and teach them that expressing their emotions is not acceptable, right? Or that they need to be perfect emotionally too. So if they're expressing disappointment or frustration and we respond by saying something like, even if we're trying to like go against perfectionism and we're like, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. You don't need to be perfect or just calm down. Everything's going to be okay. Again, we might be unintentionally teaching them to suppress their emotions. And so they might believe that expressing, expressing those emotions is a weakness and that they need to be emotionally perfect, always calm, always together, never showing any vulnerability. There's just so many little ways we could send these perfectionist messages to our kids. Like, even over scheduling them, many kid, um, parents want their kids to be well-rounded and exposed to a variety of experiences. So yes, extracurricular activities are positive. I'm always saying the benefits of having a sports team, for example, but the danger, it lies in over-scheduling, right? And so now we're setting excessively high expectations for achievement in all these different areas. So if you have a kiddo who's enrolled in multiple activities and they feel this constant pressure on them, they might start to feel like they have to be the best at everything. And so they're pushing for success in too many areas that can create this unrealistic standard of perfection across the board. And I have kids who are, they're not getting bed until midnight or one o'clock in the morning because they've got all of their extracurriculars and then they have to study and then they have to be up in the morning and they have all of these things that they need to do. And so now, you know, they're exposed expected to be happy and chipper after five or six hours of sleep and do all of their schoolwork and keep up the energy and not be snappy. Like, I don't know anyone who could do that. So we got to just make sure, you know, we're, we're recognizing these patterns. Okay. So recognizing where we might be falling into some of those traps. And then we need to be intentionally focusing on sending healthier messages to our kids so that they feel valued for who they are. And we love them and their worth and everything is for who they are. It doesn't matter what they do or don't do. Okay. I know I've already talked a lot about uh, um, what we do in previous episodes, just in terms of 
things like focusing on the process, right? And and focusing on the value and the effort and their hard work and their persistence and perseverance, celebrating the mistake of the day, right? And what we've learned, all of that's really important. Modeling self-compassion, we're forgiving ourselves for our mistakes, showing that imperfection is a natural part of life. So all of those things are really important. Validating their feelings, ensuring that they feel valued regardless of their achievements or behaviors. That's why I like externalizing those challenges, right? So, so let's pull out, you know, freaking out Fran or distracted Dan or forgetful Fred, whatever it is. I like externalizing whatever challenges you do have. So now you can work together, you know, as a team to focus on all of those things, homework avoider L, right? Rather than you didn't do your homework tonight. So we want to make sure we're doing all of those types of things. We can start looking at what can we start adding and shifting to this internal validation too, where they think about how they feel about their own efforts. I think that that's really important. And we really want to focus on kids' unique qualities and their progress rather than comparing. Maybe they're having a success journal. You know, video games I talk about, it's so powerful to see their progress. Yes, I'm on level 22. I can't wait to beat level 23, right? So having their own sort of documentation where they can see their progress and see, you know, where they're coming. And it's a good reminder for you too, where they have come from, because it's hard when we're comparing to other people, we're going to forget about all the progress they have made in their own lives. Validate, validate, validate. I, I can't talk more about that. It's, it's, it, it can be something simple like, wow, that sounds really sucky, dude right? That's all you need to do. That helps them feel heard. It teaches them that their emotions are normal and that they don't need to hide them or perfect them. Uh, instead of registering kids in all of the things, encourage them to focus on activities they really actually like, right? Give them some independence to figure out what it is that they like doing. What are activities that aren't serving them, aren't bringing them joy, I think all of those things are really important. And then, of course, if you know me, I'm going to say we got to encourage kids to take some risks, right? Get out there, stretch out of your comfort zone, make mistakes, right? You're going to learn from your experience. That's how they're going to build confidence. And, and that's how they're going to bounce back and thrive. That's where resilience comes from. So this week, I've thrown a lot out there. Try one thing intentionally. Focus on some of those traps that you might be falling into. And we want to focus on sending, you know, the message of this unconditional positive regard is what we talk in about psychology, but this unconditional approval, right? So we might drop any of the fixing or the nagging and focusing on praising effort rather than results. And just noticing that shift in, in, in your focus, a shift in language can change immediately how kids are viewing their own progress and their own worth. I will leave it there for today. Thank you for joining me. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with others who might be struggling with perfectionism in their family. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review and help those kiddos be bold and courageous. And I will see you next time.